Greetings conference attendees. I'm so happy to magically be with you to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is the magic of length of stay. This is really one of the most powerful power tools that we have in animal sheltering. For one thing, decreasing the amount of time that animals are in the shelter lowers their stress, right? We don't want to stay in a confinement environment, even a really nice one, any longer than we have to be. And what you may also have noticed, um, even if you haven't read all the science behind it, is that decreasing length of stay directly reduces risk factors for illness. In fact, length of stay is the single greatest predictor for upper respiratory infection in cats and can cough in dogs in animal shelters. And then the powerful combination of reducing illness and decreasing stress means we have decreased cost per animal which means we have more resources to allow more space and time per animal, which means we have healthier, happy animals that get out the door faster, which then frees up resources to support the community. And then we can turn that around and invest that in lowering intake, which helps us to lower stress, reduce illness, decrease our cost per animal, and the cycle continues in a really positive way. Now, I don't mean to pick on the DMV, but I do have a few images of DMV waiting rooms here because I think it's a classic example of a place where we all agree if we could get in and out a little quicker, we would appreciate that. And so similarly, even if your shelter is a lot nicer than the DMV, this is one simple question we want to ask of every animal every single day. What is the shortest possible length of stay to the best possible outcome for you? So I want to really emphasize that best possible outcome piece, because sometimes there's some confusion about how do we achieve short lengths of stay. Now, hopefully it's really obvious. We would never rush to euthanize an animal when with a little more time, maybe a live outcome could be found. But also we wouldn't even rush an animal to transfer or rescue or adoption if there's still a possibility that with following up on some identification or some other leads, we might be able to reunite that animal with its owner. Um, but if we're gonna reunite that animal with its owner, that could happen in three days instead of six. Or if that animal is gonna be returned to home or returned to field through a community cat program, we could do that in one day instead of three. Or that's your slowest stro slow track animal, but you could get it out in two weeks instead of two months. That's what we're talking about, about the best possible outcome. I hope that makes sense. Now, I want to emphasize this because for some shelters, this seems amazing and some shelters that we've worked it with. These are realistic average target lengths of stay that can be achieved. Less than seven to 10 days for animals that enter the shelter healthy and old enough to go on to their forever life. For animals that need a little extra care, whether that's behavioral rehabilitation, medical treatment, or just time to grow up to be old enough, then you want that time plus no more than seven to 10 days on average for animals to be in the shelter through and out the other side. And many shelters are able to achieve an average length of stay of even shorter than that at the same time that they are sustaining excellent outcomes and live release rates of well above 90%. In fact, we work with shelters that routinely have an average length of stay of under a week, as little as three to five days especially if a big part of your turnover are healthy cats that are just returning to field or returning to home and dogs that are quickly getting back to the owners that lost them. Now, I think it can be helpful to conceive of length of stay in three different parts. The beginning, which is coordinating your admissions with capacity in the shelter. The middle, which involves removing bottlenecks and right-sizing the population. And the, then the end, which is maximizing your return to home and minimizing your barriers to adoption or other positive outcomes. So let's take those one by one. First of all, here's something that many shelters experience as more possible than we might ever have imagined, is cutting time off of the beginning by not admitting animals until you are ready to deal with them. So for instance, if you only have a surgeon coming in Wednesday and Friday, 
not admitting healthy community cats that need sterilization before they can return home until Tuesday afternoon. So aligning your intake with the capacity that you have or bringing your foster returns in on Friday, knowing that you'll do your big adoptions over the weekend. Something that really helps with that is offering admission by appointment for all non-emergency intake. And that was the thing that the pandemic taught us is we can do this. Not only can we do this, this represents the best possible service that we can offer. And we had often, many shelters had offered owner surrender by appointment, but now we realize also healthy stray and community cats are not an emergency unless they are in a situation of exceptional risk, like in a box in the middle of a parking lot on a 90 degree day. And often even healthy dogs aren't an emergency and it would be better, in fact, to defer intake a little bit to give the finder or the community member an opportunity to explore some alternatives like posting them locally to be reunited with their home without ever coming into the shelter. Now, even if you're not in a position where you can require intake by appointment, you still often can offer it and maybe make it more convenient for people. You can offer it for free where you might have a convenience fee of $25 or something reasonable for the convenience of drop-off services. And you can just use forms that people fill out to sort of shape the, the moral pressure around setting this as the norm that good people will take an appointment in order to maximize the chance that the shelter can appro provide appropriate care for that animal and all the other animals that are also needing shelter services. So don't be afraid, even if you can't require it, to offer it in a pretty um, confident and forceful manner to really explain to the public how beneficial it is to, uh, to bring animals in by appointment for that animal and for all the other animals in the shelter. And the more speed bumps that you can set between when someone in the community thinks about bringing an animal in and the animal actually coming in the door, the more information you can gather, the more alternatives you can provide, then the more ready you can be when the animal does hit the door to create the smoothest possible pathway through the shelter. So this is an example, this is from LA County Animal Services, where every non-emergency service request just starts with a form that allows them to gather some more information and maybe talk to the person about the best time to bring that animal in or have a discussion about whether the animal needs to come in at all. So again, this isn't a requirement necessarily, it's just something to offer to begin the conversation. Now let's talk about how we can cut time out of the middle. Now you may be doing some of these things, you may be doing all of these things, but I just want to point out some of the common um, things that shelters do that aren't helpful and may needlessly increase the length of stay. So first of all, discontinue intake quarantine, if that's something that you've been doing. The only reason to quarantine animals on intake is if you're transferring in from a shelter that has known significant problems with a serious disease like parvo or panleukopenia. If that's the case, then ideally work with that shelter to help reduce the disease risks at the source. But if you're bringing them in from as strays or as owner surrenders or from a transfer partner that has reasonably good health in their population, You'll learn all you need to know in just the first couple of days of noticing whether they have formed stool, whether they're eating and drinking and urinating and seem to be free of pain and evidence of infectious disease. So no intake quarantines. They come in healthy, friendly, then move them along their pathway just as soon as possible. Also, no need for vaccine holds. The vaccines that we have for the most serious diseases of shelter animals, distemper, parvo, and panleukopenia, they are fantastic vaccines. They provide full protection within about three to five days. So again, vaccinate them when they come in, keep an eye on their ins and outs, eating, drinking, and behavior, and move them on their way. Now, puppies and kittens are a little bit of a special case there where vaccine isn't necessarily protective, but that's because they may have antibodies interfering from their mother 
And more time waiting after vaccination isn't going to make them more protected. Actually, it just means they spend more time in the very risky environment of the animal shelter. So even for youngsters, get them in, get them vaccinated immediately, and then get them on their way. We also want to think about replacing some of the things that can become bottlenecks in the shelter and also that we now understand aren't necessarily very accurate and may not serve animals very well. So we now know that formal behavioral evaluation can be not much more accurate than flipping a coin. It can create a false sense of security and it can really give us information that won't end up reflecting how the animal behaves in a home. And it can become a huge bottleneck that can slow animals pathway through the shelter. So replace routine behavior evaluations for dogs with a holistic approach that takes into account the information that you get from the owner or the finder, the information that the intake staff gets when they do an exam, give a vaccine, put a little collar on, the information that is observed while the dog is in the kennel, going out for walks with volunteers in play groups, Collect all that, and that will be much more robust than anything that a single behavior assessment can tell you, as well as happening in the normal flow of shelter operations rather than creating a bottleneck that can hang animals up. So that's a real win-win. Another thing to consider if you haven't already done this is replacing retrovirus testi testing for healthy cats and kittens with conversations with adopters and guidance for post-adoption veterinary care and testing of the adopter's new veterinarian. In healthy populations, it's just the nature of those tests that they're not gonna be very accurate and you're gonna see a lot of false positives. And especially now that we recognize that cats that have retrovirus infections but are healthy at the time of diagnosis can live really long, high quality lives and pose minimal risk to other animals in households where there's not fighting or overcrowding occurring. So that can get rid of a bottleneck and also help the adopters have a more nuanced discussion with their new veterinarian about what retrovirus testing even means and what to do if the results are positive. And then finally, here's a hopefully an easy one if the veterinarians in your area are open to the idea. This just in, actually this not just in, we've known this for a really long time. But there's been a rule that two pounds was the minimum weight for surgery for puppies and kittens. And that's just not based on any science at all. It's just a nice round number for veterinarians to remember and multiply things by. And not only that, but we've sometimes thought of an eight week old kitten as two pounds. But when you actually weigh kittens out in foster care, oftentimes 1.5 pounds is a solid eight weeks old. And we also know that kittens developmentally can do fine when they're removed from their litters a little bit sooner. And this can make a big difference in cutting out time in foster care, cutting out time in the shelter, getting kittens up for adoption when they are at their peak cuteness factor. So surgery at a robust one and a half pounds. So this isn't a skinny little wormy kitten that should be two pounds, but is only one and a half. But this is a kitten with big round belly and bright and alert and one and a half pounds. So those are some good ways to cut time out of the middle of an animal's stay in the shelter. And then one other thing to consider is to assess your stray holding periods. First of all, check. What is really the minimum stray holding period required? And what is more the tradition that's ar arisen in your shelter of like, well, if they have a microchip, we hold them this long, or we hold them over the weekend, or we hold them on holidays, or if they come in in the evening, we don't count that day. Find out what the minimum legal requirement is. And if it's prolonged, make a case to reduce it. We like to see a 72 hour hold. That's what it was dropped to in California a few years ago. And we saw return to owner go up in conjunction with that change. I'm not saying it caused that change, but the truth is, just sitting and waiting for people to come and looking for their pets, that's not the way to get them home. The way to get them home is to, through really aggressive return in-field programs, through great lost and found advertising and matchmaking, through great public communication. We have lots and lots of skills now to do this. Having them sit in the shelter waiting to get up a respiratory infection or kennel cough is not the way. So this is just an example. I looked uh, as I was preparing these slides a few days ago and happened to find a new example of a 
local shelter making the case to their community and commissioners that they should reduce their length, their length of stay for stray holding. So don't be afraid to give it a try. And then really the most important piece of cutting time out of the middle is just the absolute number of animals in the shelter at any one time. We like to talk about this as the length of the line determines the time in the line. And to pick on the DMV again a little bit, this was when California's real ID came out. So everybody had to change their license and the lines at the DMV stretch for hours and blocks. So you can imagine it like if each person in line took one minute to be served and you have 10 people in line, what's the length of time in line? 10 minutes. Let that line grow to 50 people one time because the person was on break comes back from break, takes one minute to be served, 50 people in line, everyone's gonna wait for 50 minutes. And the same in an animal shelter. Do 10 adoptions a week, have 10 animals waiting, length of stay is gonna be a week on average. Some animals will leave in a day, some animals will leave in a month, but on average, it'll be a week. Do 10 adoptions a week, have 40 animals waiting, every animal's gonna wait four weeks on average with all the costs and stress and risk of illness associated with that. So one of the most powerful things we can do is work within capacity and reduce the population in the shelter to just those animals that need to be there now to get needed medical services or be placed for adoption or be sent back home. And this is a beautiful thing that we actually got to experience for the first time in forever for many shelters during the pandemic was the opportunity to work within capacity and a greater public understanding of what the real risks are when we exceed capacity. So this is from the newspaper in California over the time of the pandemic. We hit the emergency breaks when ICU capacity slipped to 15%. That is when ICUs were 85% full. Well, that's how it should be for shelters. When you are less than 85% full, you are full. We shouldn't be full at 100%. We certainly shouldn't be full at 120 130, 150, 200% in July, right? Operating beyond capacity, operating beyond full is increases length of stay inevitably, as well as increasing stress, increasing disease risk. And even if it doesn't end up costing lives through euthanasia in the shelter, it costs lives because of the effort that's expended on that overcrowding and all the risks associated with it reduces the resources to invest in keeping animals out and safe in the community. So you should be aiming to operate at 75% of maximum capacity or less, so that even when you get a big hoarding case or something else happens where an influx of animals comes in, you can accommodate that without compromising your pathway planning and your systems. So we've talked about it. Steady state, number of individuals waiting determines the length of time waiting. If you want to get a rough idea of what's the right number of animals to have waiting, just divide your monthly outcomes by two for the high end of the number waiting or four for the low end. And that gives you the range of the ideal population to have in the shelter at any one time. And then if you find, oh, we have twice as many animals as that, no problem. Manage your admissions, do some promotions, call on your transfer partners, and get the population back on track when you get out of whack. Here's one of our favorite quotes about this seems this is hard to believe. And a lot of times people are amazed when we tell them what the right number is, but there does seem to be some magical thing that happens when you get your numbers right. Um, and it's not only for the fast track animals, it's even for the slower track animals, they can fly through the shelter too. And then finally, we want to cut some time off the end if we can. Remember that return to home, return to field, as we used to call that when community cats are trapped, neuter, and return, that tends to be our fastest outcome as well as our best outcome, right? A favorite thing is to see animals go back home to the people who love them. So maximize your returns. Don't manage that one time that one bad thing happens. Recognize if you have a prolonged length of stay and crowding in the shelter, lots of bad things will happen. And focus on providing support after adoption rather than trying to fix and anticipate everything 
ahead of time. And then we want to keep traffic flowing. So outcome pathways should be planned either from the moment an animal comes in the door or even before. You want to prioritize space in surgery and adoption for animals that can move out really quickly and just get out of the system. So instead of having some kittens waiting in the back for surgery, when you know that they could be out the door and out of, out of the shelter forever, if they just could be up for adoption the next day, just get that done. Meanwhile, market your slower track, your more challenging animals from the day they come in, if not sooner. Don't wait till they've been there for two, three, four weeks before you, you know, pull out all the marketing balloons and whistles and fancy things. Know that when this cat comes in, when this dog comes in, it's going to be a little harder to find a match. So start working on it right away. And every day, look through the population and ask that question. What can I do to get you to the best possible outcome? in the shortest possible time. I've gotten so many emails like this in the time of the pandemic and would never have wished that on the world, but at least this is one thing that has changed for so many shelters and I don't ever wanna go back. Population has been manageable for over a year from 30 to 75 animals where we used to average over 300. Staff morale has increased, compassionate care is being displayed Enrichment for all animals is the top priority. Let's make this the new normal because the animals deserve it, our communities deserve it, and you and your teams deserve to be able to provide that level of care. So thank you so much.